We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. What's that football focus doing? Last week they had Brady. This week they got. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. As a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right, so, we're going team by team. I would be very careful about slinging stuff. Am I gonna get sued? We got legal on this. I like football. I like football season. All the things that go with it. Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast, Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson. We're live on YouTube. I'm back after yesterday's marathon show, Sam, mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. Brad Spielberger. Yep. You guys gave off-season grades to all 32 teams. All 32. You had an all 32-team show. In one show. Yeah. It's possible. Could have been eight shows. And you had 32. Did one. Yeah. Definitely could have been two. But yeah, go check that out. Great show. You know, the time got away from us a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> Shocking. Absolutely shocking it's very rare for this podcast to know it's not just me no it's probably Um, me great show here today though because uh we're going to talk about nfl playoff teams that uh, are going to make it who didn't make it last year Mm -hmm. and then we're going to disappoint some fan bases because it is positivity season and we're going to say hey some teams aren't going to make it who made it last year well also if you're going to stick in you know five new teams then you got to get rid of five teams otherwise it doesn't work too many teams in the playoffs yeah i uh what goes in must also come out mine are a little uneven they don't make sense but what? Don't worry about it. It's very much a zero-sum prospect. Like, we know how many teams make the playoffs every year. Yeah, the AFC's tough. <laughs> AFC, the, the NFL could also change the rules. So, it could be a in addition to playoff. being, we could consult in GM, we could have consultant commissioner, and you just increase the number of seeds in the AFC. That's right. The yes. AFC is better, therefore they get three, four more teams in the playoffs. We should honestly do that. I mean, you could say this year the AFC gets eight, the NFC gets four. And I think that's fair. Wow. I would also lose week 17 if I were commissioner. <laughs> Maybe I'll get go to a commissioner press conference. Yeah. What are you going to do? We're going to lose a game, and that's it. But now you're losing money for all the, the owners. They're going to fire you immediately. Oh, they got plenty of money. Listen, guys, you're making plenty of money. That's a terrible sales pitch to billionaires, let me tell you. Yeah. As a man with an intimate understanding of billionaire mindset, they don't want to hear, we're going to lose some money here. Well, I'll also be back. I'll be back at the podium. Consulting this is, as general so, manager. This might be, uh, I might feed into this, you know, with my general disposition of sunny positivity at all times, but there's somebody in the chats, yesterday is what's possible. Steve is holding back the show. And I say, so that's you That's getting, my one heckler. I have a heckler, just like you have a heckler. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So I get it as well. There's just a lot of negativity in the chat these days. I don't appreciate that. No. Again, but, you know, as I told Waltz the other day, appreciate the interaction. Mm. The interaction's mm-hmm. good. Um, guess what? I got to work even harder here. We've got, uh, I have new things to say. Oh, yeah? If you're looking to organize your financial future, I am. Make sure you start with life insurance. Fabric by Gerber Life provides an easy one stop shop for all your family's financial needs, offering high quality term life insurance policies plus other financial solutions in one easy online hub. Fabric, Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy quickly, often in less than 10 minutes. Life insurance can have a bad rap for being complicated, but Fabric makes it easy to apply with its seamless digital experience. It's all online and on your time. And if you need the extra support, you can access a team of licensed agents who can answer questions along the way. So take steps to help protect your family today with Fabric by Gerber Life. Take the 60-second quiz to find out if term life insurance is right for you and apply today in just 10 minutes at meetfabric.com slash PFF. That's meetfabric.com slash PFF. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash PFF policies issued by Western Western Southern Life Insurance Company and distributed by Gerber Life Agency, LLC, using fabric technologies not available in certain states. Price is subject to underwriting and health questions. For more information, visit us at meatfabric.com slash PFF. Should have got George in for the terms and conditions. You George, George is better at terms and conditions you than me. wrote it right off the rails right so, away. At least he's bringing something to the table. You know, we need that. Mm-hmm. Got to have a good terms and conditions guy. All right, so we decided we're going to talk about playoff teams who are not going to make it next year 
yeah. teams that didn't make the playoffs who will make it well, because we, we know this happens every whichever year. way you want to do it uh by the way nfl podcast at pff.com is the email address to hit us up at we've had an insane amount of emails come in people who loved consultant gm uh, segment well, that'll be back today there's I think, a bunch of questions coming in already right i think we should make it a weekly segment um in I, perpetuity uh like there's enough to do on every show right easily now, at the moment anyway if that kind of pace keeps up well we're stocked for a while uh but anyway keep them coming in also general emails like we love hearing whatever you got to say we had somebody email in uh philip chicola i guess uh a guy who was at the estadio alejandro villanueva in lima peru who was oh, that's right. emailing yeah. us in about that yeah you know that is good i, I should have acknowledged that you the should great. also you the should great. take a visit there at some point i should lima peru him. I don't know, Alejandro Villanueva. You probably, you, you don't feel like a guy that would do well at altitude. I think, isn't Lima one of the highest capitals oh, in it? the world or whatever? Yeah, I played... Uh, You're already at altitude, so add more yeah. altitude to that, and that just seems like an, a hypoxia problem. Yeah, I don't want to bore people with my story, but like, I played <laughs> in Colorado Springs, uh -huh. where it's over, it was like 6,500 feet above sea level, I believe it is. It is, it is harder to breathe in play up. And so that is, that's where Air Force plays. And I was, you know, as a pitcher, you know, you run some sprints before the game and all that stuff. I was like three sprints in and, you know. Oh, you're okay. Winded. Lima is, in fact, not particularly high above sea level. I have that wrong. It's good that you fact-checked yourself. Mm. It's only a few hundred feet. Great. So, anyway, Colorado Springs, though, 6,000. And when you give up home runs, the ball flies and they fly into the clouds. Mm. So you give up home runs into the clouds in Colorado Springs. It's not fun. I... My only altitude sort of story from Colorado is I drove Pikes Peak once. Yeah. So at Pikes Peak, you know, the, the big race, not a race track, it's just a race. It's a race road up the mountain, Pikes Peak. And they do it in, you know, rally cars and insane, like, specially designed vehicles and stuff. I drove up it in a rental 2000 Chevy Monte Carlo. Ah. Uh, and it went fine. You know, you get up the mountain, you look around, then you got to come back down the mountain. And when you reach a certain point... There are signs at the side of the, the track that simply say, hot brakes fail. You're like, well, okay, what am I supposed to do with that information? I mean, I, I require the brakes to stop me just, you know, going 100 miles an hour down the mountain. So I need to keep pushing on them, which is going to lead to them failing. Like, what, I, what is the action from this piece of information that I'm supposed to be getting? How'd your brakes do? I mean, I, I'm alive, so you made it. they, they made it. It's good to know. All right, we ready? Uh, are we? Sure. Talk playoff teams? Okay. Do you have anything else from the mailbag? I mean, there's mailbag things. We'll get to them later in the show. But uh, I just wanted to bring up because the, the Alejandro Villanueva Stadium, Estadio that is Alejandro awesome. Villanueva is not exactly a segment, but it's worth bringing up, you know? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, Non-playoff teams. Who, let's start positive here. Okay. Non-playoff teams who will make the playoffs who do you have here who's making the playoffs next year uh so two easy ones uh starting with detroit could have should have made it last year they're also on my list didn't yeah. got better in the off season should make it this year green bay lost aaron Rodgers. the door is wide open for the detroit lions to make the playoffs um and then the other one is also aaron Rodgers adjacent the new york jets again could have should have made it last year didn't now got aaron Rodgers. Why wouldn't you make it this year? We both we both took two of the same teams. Well, those are the two obvious ones. Yeah, I think they are. Um, that's where I kind of cheated a little bit. I may have – it was so much easier. The exercise was, here, find some playoff teams that won't make it and, and vice versa. And it was like, oh, these NFC teams are sure to regress. It's a lot easier to predict that. Predicting the AFC teams who are going to regress was um, much more difficult, I think, which AFC team – because – there's certainly a lot more positivity around all of the AFC teams, teams like the Dolphins, who could be the – they could be third in the AFC. I mean, they're, they're sure. probably projected to be third in the AFC East, but they're still a very good team. I love what they've done this offseason. The AFC North is loaded. It's really tough to look at those teams that, um, that made it last year in the AFC. But mm -hmm. it's easy to say, ah, these NF NFC teams won't make it. But, yeah, yeah I, I had those two teams, Jets and Aaron Rodgers – Lions because they did great this offseason, I think. No, they did. I they're mean, on the way up. We gave them, a, I forget what it was, I think an A last, uh, and last, last day's show yesterday is, in fact, the technical term for that. Um, 
they've had a great offseason. We can quibble over the you know position value and how exactly they attacked the draft, but the bottom line is they added a lot of really good players to a team that was already right on the cusp of the playoffs, and the division presumably got easier because Green Bay shipped off Aaron Rodgers and the Minnesota Vikings continued to tread water. I want, because I watched so much uh, early 90s football and all that stuff, are there teams right now, have we, have we lost the ability for a team to like slowly build up and actually get better and better and better every year and then become good and kind of peak in year three or four? Have we lost a little bit of that other than... The Lions. No, other than QB changes, like massive QB changes, right? So like the Chiefs, of course, became a juggernaut. The Bills have essentially, got, because of Josh Allen's development, became one of the best teams. The Bengals became one of the best teams. So like the, the couple teams that, were, that I'm reminded of, the Bucks in the late 90s, had this really good defense, and they just kept better and better and better. And then in 2002, they win a Super Bowl. Even my 90s Jags, they kind of like built it up, built it up, built it up. And then in 99, they were 14-2, and two, and it was, it was kind of, you know, culminated in this big season. I, felt, I feel like you saw that more back then, where now it's just like, if you get the quarterback, you become one of those teams. The Lions, it seems like they're doing it this old school way. Let's see if it works, of kind of a slow burn, right? Build the offensive line. Add some playmakers. You get a good enough quarterback in there at Goff, and now they're going for it, right? They've added some veteran pieces. They had five picks in the top 63 in the draft, and, you know, this should be their year in Detroit. Yeah, I mean, Have I we think, lost a little bit of that in the NFL generally? Yes. Uh, I think the timelines are just shortened. Like, it used to take that amount of time. I mean, it depends how far back you go. If you go back prior to free agency, then the only real way of adding players was through the draft. So by definition, it needed to take longer because you couldn't just go out there and, like, buy a new roster. Um, Once free agency started to happen, I think you could do it a little bit more quickly. But even then, there was at least a decade of teams figuring out how free agency was supposed to function, how you manage a roster, how the salary cap works, all that kind of stuff. Now teams are much better at it. But... It does mean that you have this massive volume of roster turnover year to year, so it doesn't take three, four years to completely overhaul and build up a roster bit by bit. Like, you can do it fast. You can go from bad to pretty good in in an offseason, and it's difficult to sell anybody on the idea that, you know, this project is going to need to take four years. Really? Because, like, there's countless evidence of this happening overnight almost all over the league so why is your job going to take four years like why do i need that extra amount of time um so yeah i I think the timeline has just shrunk generally the eagles did it man the eagles just did it well you can do it like it's not nothing has changed nothing has rendered the scenario where that happens impossible it's just nobody almost nobody sets out with that specific plan because you don't need to like you can achieve it much quicker than that, so why would you take that amount of time? A few people in the chat are mentioning the Steelers as a team that might. Like, I, I get some of that vibe against uh, from the Steelers that I feel like the roster is creeping back toward uh, better, into the right direction. But, but they never kind of so much they never depends suck. on. They never did suck, obviously, but I feel like they're they definitely became this fringe playoff team. Like they really snuck in in 2021 and got wrecked last year. They didn't make it and. I think they're on their way back up. It just really matters what uh, Kenny Pickett does. So, we both have the Jets and the Lions making it. Who else do you have making the playoffs this year who did not make it last year? So, that was the end of the easy ones. Um, After this, there's some speculation and or projection involved. I think the Saints make it because they win that division. And that division is open to be won. We have the same answers. Well, I think these are the logical ones. The next two, I think, is where it gets sketchy. Um, Are win projections over 10 per PFF? How about that? It's it's a very easy division. Because the opponent ELO ranking is 30. Yes. Easiest schedule in the NFL. One of the worst divisions in the NFL. Therefore, they win lots. That'll be interesting. And they have Derek Carr, who's, you know, good, not great. Yeah, Derek Carr might be the best quarterback in that division. Right. Derek Carr going up against rookie Bryce Young, second-year Desmond Ritter, Mm -hmm. and Baker Mayfield Mm -hmm. in Tampa Bay. Who's better than anybody from this quarterback class if you listen to Bruce Arians? You really listen to Bruce Arians? Off-season chatter? I mean, I listen to it. I don't believe it. Before Tom Brady came back, before last season, he was ready to... He's like, yeah, Blaine Gabbert's ready. Yeah. Blaine's going to run the show here Uh in Tampa Bay. It's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. So I also chose the Saints. 
Okay. I just think they had injury issues last year. Um, I notably, historically, do overweigh the injured veterans coming back, the Michael Thomases of the world coming back. I completely overweigh what their potential impact is going to be. <laughs> uh, it's probably why I like what the Steelers did. I'm like, wait, they just added Allen Robinson to the mix? Of course he's going to be great with all those guys. So the Saints bring in Michael Thomas back and year two of Chris Olave and bringing in Derek Carr if the offensive line stays healthy. I think my biggest question for the Saints is the defensive line, right? How, mu how much will they get from some of the youngsters that they have over there, the mm -hmm. young guys that they brought in? Isaiah Foskey, Brian Brissy, uh Cameron Jordan regressed a little bit last year. But the Saints, even last year, they were – they showed signs of really dominant defense at times. That's kind of like been their MO. Half the, half the season looks really great defensively for the Saints. So I think they're capable, especially with the, with the poor division. So, yeah, it was a lot easier to find NFC teams that won't make it or NFC teams that, um, that have a chance to make the playoffs this year. Yeah, well, like I said, those are the three, I think, that are the easiest to do. Two that I think definitely should happen. One that is the most logical of the next. Two happen, then it gets iffy. So go on. What's your next one? I, I did three. Were we supposed to do more? I did five total, I decide. You've only got three. You, you tapped out after it got difficult. Is that, that where we went with it? So there are seven playoff spots. Yes. I was not anticipating a turnover of 71.4% of the playoff field. Well, that's rather unimaginative of you. Yeah. You want me to find more teams that are going to make Two the more, because I had All the right. top five and a, a top five. I don't want to remove any AFC teams, but the <laughs> Ravens are going to be in the mix this year. They with are. Lamar back and healthy. They so the Ravens the obviously mix. didn't make the playoffs last year, and they'll be uh, – no, they did make the playoffs. I'm sorry. They did. Yeah. Tyler Huntley. So forget it. Okay. Yeah, I'm unprepared. Yeah. I'm unprepared. Right. I only you did want three. my next two? <coughs> so – I'll find someone else. Three are obvious. Three are uh, easy <laughs> enough to achieve. After that, it gets very, very iffy. I started looking at this spot uh, – at this point as to who might miss out, right? So the Giants last year, they made the playoffs. You know we're both – we both picked the Giants and the Vikings. The, to the, miss out, of the course Giants, we did. Right, the Giants made the playoffs last year in a relatively fraudulent manner and won't do it this year. So they're going to miss out. Consequently, you look to the NFC East, and you're like, who else could make the playoffs? Washington were pretty much in the mix despite having no real quarterback. Now, they still might not have any real quarterback, but if Sam Howell is halfway good, which is possible, Washington's got a really good roster around him. Washington makes the playoffs. Washington over the Giants? Sam Howell drags the Washington Commanders as they say goodbye to Daniel Schneider all the way to the postseason. This is... <laughs> they're just riding the, uh, the off-season momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, it depends on Sam Howell. I mean, that's going to be fun, man. A team... We get to see... We get two teams investing in mid-to-late-round quarterbacks, basically, giving them a chance. Falcons with Desmond Ritter. Washington with... Sam Howell and you know we we talk a lot about oh you got to go find this next great quarterback and keep taking shots and all that stuff neither guy played poorly enough that you that you're like well this guy's got no shot Sam Howell had almost no opportunities but neither Desmond Ritter or Sam Howell said like of course you got to build around this guy it, we they're just unknowns they're both complete unknowns they're both guys because we always overrate quarterbacks before the draft all of us we said they could be potential first-rounders. Neither guy went in the first round. And they have opportunities here. So, yeah, it'll depend on Sam Howell and his development. But, yeah, it's a good, it's a good situation in Washington. Um, every couple of years, though, too, we have, we have teams that, are, that have good records. And you get into the offseason, and we drop stuff like fraudulent. Mm. We say stuff like that. We say, we hey, this team, will, this team will never be able to replicate what they did last year. Uh -huh. And um, it feels like the Giants – and the Vikings are going to be the two teams that we highlight a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we already have some uh, Giants media people and fans, I think, are, are they're going to be upset with us overall. I mean, you only because have to look at when you get to the offseason and you start looking at free agency in the draft. Like, we, there were a lot of good teams, playoff teams generally last season. You look at the draft, you're like, not a lot of holes in this roster. Let's pick off a spot or two here, you know, address this obvious area of need. That's their one weakness. And then they're good. Every time you got to the Giants, you're like, they need everything. They can go anywhere. This is a great spot for them in the draft because they get to dress any one of half a dozen needs. That's not the situation of a playoff team. Certainly not when your quarterback is Daniel Jones rather than like Patrick Mahomes who could drag whatever kind of roster to the postseason. Like the Giants were not as good as they uh, ended up having, as they ended up record-wise last year and, and sort of 
uh, like results wise. So they finished ten eight and one. I guess the uh, the thing you just have to be aware of is you can't just be well. They were a ten win team, and we we got better. Right, they had a good draft. They did feel you know added Darren Waller, which I like. That's great. Daniel Jones will continue to progress and all that stuff. It is it's going to be difficult, I think, for the Giants. The one thing though is is we don't know if the Brian Dayball factor is that big of a factor, right? Like, is he actually one of those coaches sure. who makes a consistent difference? I don't believe there are more. Honestly, coaches are like quarterbacks. There's five or six that make a significant difference, I think, year in, year out. There's a whole bunch of good coaches, but, you know, they're, they're still only as good as their talent to a point. And there's a, I think there's a handful of coaches who are always going to elevate. We don't know if Brian Dable's in that mix, if he actually is that guy that doesn't matter who he's trotting out there. But once you do give the Giants better talent, they're, you know, they're, then, they're, then they're, you know, going to the NFC Championship and stuff like that. We don't know that yet. Year one was nice, but yeah, it, they do look like a regression candidate, even with all of the nice additions this offseason, because every other team made nice additions this offseason as well. Mm-hmm. So my uh, fifth team that did not make the playoffs last year that will this season is, so this time my logic was, well, let's look at a really difficult division and work on the basis that somebody's coming out of that as a wild card team. Uh, consequently, the Cleveland Browns will make the playoffs this year. Yeah. Look at the work they've a done. A mighty roar. Cheers from, from the sound the, booth. From the, uh, the booth, the Cleveland fan Tyler Sovjek in there. <clears throat> like we just praised the, the work they'd done along the defensive line, bringing in Darius Smith, Dalvin Tomlinson, like Okorunquo, all the work they've done uh, to add players alongside Miles Garrett. That should help the secondary that was already talented perform much better this year. Um, the offensive line is one of the best in the league. They've added receivers. Like, that's a pretty good core right now. Nick Chubb at running back, obviously David Njoku at tight end. Anything north of where Deshaun Watson was last season, which would be difficult not to achieve this year, should propel them at least into playoff contention. And then, you know, you just need to bounce your way. I can't wait to see who you have not making the playoffs in the AFC. Because, like, all the, again, like, all the roster analysis is correct. Yeah. I love a lot of what the Browns have done. And it completely depends on, you know, Deshaun Watson graded at 55 last year. Yeah, bad. 55. And it really comes down to, was he rusty for five or six weeks? Um, because it also didn't make sense, the order in which he played, right? He was like, he was okay at first, and then he got worse as the, as the season went on. Maybe he's just not a cold weather player, Maybe. Deshaun Watson, even though he solved that in the game where they scored 10 points when it was cold out. Yeah, so mine don't actually match up in terms of, I just have five teams not making it, but they're not the same five teams that would have to happen to accommodate. That's the five what I was teams. saying. That's what I was saying. But mine, I can fix mine it. Were unbalanced. I can fix it though with a simple adjustment. You said it's a zero sum game, and you're over here well, like, oh, let me just. Talk well, I just about had the five. NFC team. I just had five going in, five going out. I hadn't actually factored in the conferences, but I'm only one off that way. Exactly so we're good. What we're I was fine. saying. We're fine. Minutes ago. We're fine. So yeah, is Deshaun Watson the guy who graded in the 80s and 90 over 90? You know, most of his career. Or the guy who graded at 55. Well, it feels like he should be somewhere to the on the spectrum of the first part. Like maybe he's never going to get to that 90 level again. Maybe we're never going to see him up if, there. If with he's the low 80s, home. though, right. there. But if he legit. gets if he gets even to like 75 next year, it's a massive improvement over what they had last season, and should be good enough to take them to again at least playoff contention. And then you know who knows if they make it or not in week 17. They 18. have to get better defensively, but yeah, they've they've added a lot there. I think. So. Yeah. I think the Browns are fair. Another team that I considered okay. in the three. All right, so who who are we taking out of the playoff race here? Well, we already mentioned one of them. The New Giants. York Giants are gone to accommodate Washington. Um, we already mentioned another one. The Minnesota Vikings are gone. Uh, they, I think, are less obvious or less guaranteed than the Giants. I, don't, I think there's virtually no chance the Giants make the playoffs again this year. I think there's a reasonable chance the Vikings do because... The Vikings are tough to remove in that division. Right. That yeah. division is still not great. They're always reasonably good. They have a very high floor for what they're going to achieve in any given season. They're going to be contending for the playoffs, and that's just whether or not they make it. So let's say they don't this year. The run of 11 one-score games all breaking in their direction doesn't even have to go the other way. It just has to split down the middle, and they don't make the playoffs this year. I don't know that they've done enough to that roster to improve. They would be relying on the fact that the Packers got worse and then, you know, maybe the Lions and the Bears don't get better by the amount that they're expecting and they can still sort of lead the way. But, man, that defense is still in bits. 
it's not looking good on paper. Danelle Hunter and Marcus Davenport looks fine, but outside of that, like linebacker is rough, secondary is rough. They just they've got problems on that side of the ball. I'm I'm just fascinated by the Vikings because they are. It was mentioned that we talked a lot about them on the last show. They're going younger in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. Um, historically in the NFL, younger doesn't always mean you're in trouble. Like I'm fascinated by the Rams because. You lose a lot of big na- you lose some big names there in Los Angeles. You lose some big names in Minnesota, but can can the young guys piece it together a little bit there? But yeah, I mean, I, I think the Vikings feel like an obvious candidate because they overachieved last year. But at the same time, can they wait, can they go ten and seven this year and make sure. the playoffs in a weak NFC? Absolutely. Could they, they be better could. than the Lions? Like the Lions are our darlings and all that stuff. But could the Vikings be better than the Lions? Sure. We don't know what the Packers are going to be because the Jordan Love uh, unknown. And we, we don't know if the Bears are there yet, despite moving in the right direction mm-hmm. roster-wise. So, yeah, the North is I mean, is I'd be open. surprised. Yeah, I guess not surprised. But I, I would be surprised if the Bears were in any way contending in that division, even though they should be a lot better this year. All right, who else do you have not making the playoffs? So, Giants don't make it. Vikings don't make it. Tampa Bay Buccaneers don't make it. My three, yeah. Baker Mayfield, I'm out. I'm done with that. I'm, I'm even more out with Kyle Trask is the answer. If that, if they have to turn to him, I just there's enough in that division where even in a bad division and a reasonable roster, Tampa Bay doesn't get it done. Yeah, the thing that you know the the the, the way it would work the opposite, I guess, would be Byron left, which is out. You know how much was sure. just having a new system. And you still have a good group of playmakers. And people like... But there's, whole, there's just way more holes on the offensive line and on the defensive side than they had last year at this time. I, I think it's... I think it would be difficult to overstate how much of a potential problem Byron Leftwich has been in that offense. Like, all the stuff that's publicly available is obvious enough, you know? Just basically, every time he's asked about anything basic like epa or whatever it's like somebody's bringing up a foreign language to him and he's like i don't know what you're talking about i run the ball like he's like a walking human cliche from the 1980s of you know pro football the world has moved on from then and even if you're not a big analytics guy you should have a vague idea of the concepts that are being discussed when somebody's throwing this kind of stuff at you so everything that you've seen at press conferences is probably only scratching the surface or the tip of the iceberg of exactly the way Byron Leftwich is running that whole thing. So well said. Thanks. <laughs> I think that you you should probably not understate how big of a potential move that is to remove him from the equation and go with somebody who understands anything that's happened in the league in the past twenty five years. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- so again, on the including positive by side, the way, the last twenty five years encapsulates his career. Like, it's even more mind-blowing because he was in it during that, like, development period. He's our age. I I know. know. It's nuts. Um, Baker Mayfield, as we're out on him, feels like the time when he's just going to play great. Right. Um, You know, so I'm trying to, like, spin it positive. But, like, on the surface, clearly I agree. The Bucs, you know, shouldn't make the playoffs, I don't think, with where they are right now in their current situation. But, again, that NFC South. I mean, it's so dependent on quarterback. Like, if Baker, Baker Mayfield graded with 50 last year, that's atrocious. If he goes back to that year in Cleveland where he had, like, an 80-plus grade and, you know, looked like he was going to put it together and really go on a run, if that happens next year, which wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. I mean, look at the receiving core in Tampa Bay. Everything's possible right. but, with Baker now. But even in terms of situation, like, the receiving core is really good there. Uh, if they can stay healthy. The offensive line, sure, it's not as good as it was, but it should still be pretty solid. Um, again, the the scheme change, the change in coach from dinosaur to anything approaching modern-day football should be huge. It's absolutely in the range of possible outcomes, as I say, having finally given up on it ever happening again. It, there shouldn't be a reason Baker Mayfield can't rediscover that form. It's just I'm done expecting it to happen. Yes, that's all fair. See, I also had the Bucks not making the playoffs. Okay, easy. I didn't have any good AFC teams that I wanted to go out on a limb for and say, hey, they're not going to make it, Coward. even though I think the Jets will make it. So the fourth, I had a fourth NFC team, which I will forget about for the, I will change, right? I had Seattle not making it. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but let's say, they, let's say they have to stay because we're going to make this balance now. Uh, my AFC team that I had not making it this I year. Know. You don't know. I do. Who do you know? Miami. Ah, eat it. 
It's not Miami. The Los Angeles Chargers. No. Look, every year, they're no. the offseason favorites. This is their year. They're going to go to the Super Bowl. Justin Herbert's God. And then the whole thing collapses because the entire roster gets hurt. This is their six. year. This is 23 is their year. Stop it. No, it's never going to be their year until they figure out how to stop getting the entire roster injured by halfway through the season. They're done. So the Chargers are not making the playoffs. They, again, they're going to fail. They're going to fall at the final hurdle. And one of my AFC teams, Cleveland, is going to jump them for a wild card spot. Are you going to stick with this? I mean, we're going to do, we're going to come back in July. It'll be training camp, and we're going to do our season previews in August, and we're going to make our predictions and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, look, I've got a record of I put the Chargers in the playoffs for the last 29 years, right? right. I mean, that's just you just got to stick with it. <laughs> and I'm going to stick with it again this year because this is the year. Yeah. Uh, but so are you going to come back in August? I, I never remember what I say in May. That sounded when it like comes you to were, August. Uh, I never come back to it. That sounded like you were confessing to a criminal past. Look, I've got a record. <laughs> I've got a record. Um, We've cleaned it up. I mean, look, I'm sure somebody will bring it back to my attention. The chances are I'll forget about it when we're actually doing you this. You have to real. remember what you said on May 17th. I, no, I, I, I don't have that kind of brain. My brain is filled is up it, with other stuff. This is just May content. Yeah. Okay. Now, look, if someone wants to remind me that I did that when we're doing that show, that's all well and dandy. But for the moment, I'm going to say the Chargers fall at the final hurdle, as is so often the case and are not going to be the Super Bowl team that everyone will predict. Can we clip that, please? Let's save that. Let's save that for our preview show. You call because I, I didn't have the heart to do it. I just can't do it. Yeah, I cannot. I, I cannot doubt the offseason darling Los Angeles Chargers. I mean, look, there's an entirely good chance that they do make the playoffs and everything is dandy. But it's when you look at their history, even in recent years. You couldn't exactly call it crazy to call it the, to predict the other way. Kellen Moore's coming in and Quentin yeah. Johnston's you know coming in as wide receiver three. Uh -huh. it's, it's all exciting times. Yeah, for the Chargers. Uh huh. That guy's going to be healthy all year. Number three. Yeah. What about the rest of the people? Yeah, they might they might get hurt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you got the Chargers out yep. in exchange for the Browns. Sure. And then who else? So you get the Dolphins making the playoffs. That's great. I thought you were going to be. I thought Dolphins fans were going to be all over you. Yeah. They're real sensitive. Right so now. then my other team that I'm going to change to, who wasn't on my original five, but is going to have to make way to accommodate a fifth or a second AFC team is Baltimore. Will not make the playoffs. Correct. Wow. Mm -hmm. With with Lamar, is it because Lamar gets hurt for the third straight year at the end of the year? No. Okay. I think they'll be good. I just, I mean, look, we've got Lamar Jackson. We've got OBJ with a lot of money attached to him. Who knows what he really is at this point, having like, his recent history. Um, he's got to go back to being a number one, really, in this offense, which we haven't seen for a while. Uh, even if he does, we haven't seen, you know, what he we haven't seen him for a while. Uh, a lot of money attached to him. The pivot in offensive system. We've gone away from Greg Roman. We're bringing in Todd Munkin. How is Lamar Jackson going to function within this system? Does it look the same? Does it have the same kind of impact? All of a sudden, does the offensive line regress because the methodology that's been protecting and or enhancing their play over the last few years in this Greg Roman system is not operating the same. They've, they've gone away from that and asked them to do more conventional things. Is that going to have these unintended consequences that, that we're not really thinking about? I just think there's enough things at work in Baltimore that this team could take a little step back and a little step back would be all it takes for them to miss the playoffs. How do you feel? Do you like the, uh, the, seemingly imbalanced AFC NFC right now I have no particular strong thoughts on it one way or the other I don't I find it very difficult to care yes the AFC is dramatically stronger than the NFC do I find any real problem with that or fault or want to rail against that reality no it's just how it is right now yeah it just makes it I mean it's exciting man I mean all those division games AFC but I'm East, also like, I'm not, East, North, and West all feel loaded. Right. And I'm not, you get these people, that, you know, we talked about it earlier, right? Would you take like two playoff spots from the NFC given the AFC? Like, no, like this is just the way the world is right now. Go back in time, you'll find playoff situations where all the good teams were on one side. You know, the, the playoffs in the NFC was a gauntlet, but the AFC was a cakewalk. Like, this is just the way it worked. And yeah. the NFC title game was a better Super Bowl than the Super Bowl was because those are the best two teams in the NFL. Like, that's just how the world is. 49ers, Cowboys, and Packers were all 
Right, like think pretty of the strong num- teams in the NFC. Think in the of 90s. the number of times either the 49ers or the Cowboys had to get past the other one in order to even make it to a Super Bowl to win or lose that thing. Whereas in the AFC, you could just bumble your way through the playoffs to just get wrecked by whichever, whichever one of the dynastic teams had made it that far. Like this is just the world we're in right now. In the AFC, you're going to have to get past Kansas City, Buffalo, Cincinnati, whoever to have any shot of making it. And in the N- in the NFC. Right now on paper, it's Philadelphia and San Francisco. And San Francisco might not even have a quarterback. So, I mean, that's just, this is the world right now. Yeah, so it just, it just makes, makes our job harder, picking uh, AFC North winners and AFC West winners. Uh, <coughs> last year, we thought maybe the Bengals would regress, but that didn't happen at all. But, you know, the Browns did pretty strongly because, you know, Watson wasn't as good and they had Brissett for most of the year at quarterback. So, yeah, it just makes it, uh, like, it, makes it more challenging. So the Ravens aren't making the playoffs. You're locked in, locking that in, huh? I mean, they're the they're the fifth team. Guarantee. The blogs are going to pick this up. Yeah, they're looking for some mate content. Oh, this will be it's like the, yeah, the guarantee. Like PFF predicts Baltimore does not make the playoffs. PFF. You should. How about a disclaimer? Uh, Sam's. It's too late. It's already out there. No, no. Sam's opinions do not necessarily reflect the opinion of all of PFF. What was the flash up the graphic again? What does our PFF predictions have on Baltimore? Maybe they do reflect the opinions of PFF, and I just happen to have coincidentally come to the same our opinions, the same take. The, the PFF opinions on the Cleveland Browns are very favorable. Yeah. I know that. Over 10 wins yeah. projected. They shot up on the uh, the power rankings that were put up as well. The power power rankings are high. And, it, and I think that's mostly because the most recent data on Deshaun Watson, most recent as in like more than a six-game sample size, is strong. And that's as in it wasn't recent time-wise, but – Seven games ago was his last game in 2020, right? So yeah, 2020, he was an elite quarterback. We have five games of below average play. It's probably really weighing uh, Deshaun Watson. Yeah, as Tyler points out, we don't have a Ravens graphic because neither one of us put him in. We just ad-libbed them onto the, onto the list. <laughs> just just uh, write it Just write it up. Just yeah. make one. He has yeah, a pre-prepared one for the other teams that we didn't have give you, him a Have you learned anything about. doing uh, TV? You don't just call for graphics that don't exist. No, no. I mean, it makes sense. Perfect sense once you point it out, you know, once you articulate that actually yeah. that was not a team we were supposed to be talking about right now. It makes perfect sense that there's no graphic pre-prepared for them. All right. What, uh, so that's it. You think the Dolphins are making that? I thought you were going to pick the Dolphins. No. Why would why wouldn't AFC East is going to be fun? Yeah, so I love I love the Dolphins roster. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And when we were talking the other day about the the Matt Ryan, like Matt Ryan comes in, he was going to fix the Colts. Multiple emails came back saying, "You guys forgot that's going to be Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is going to be the guy that maybe comes right. in. He's going to fix the Jets, and they're going to be disappointed. They're going to finish eight and nine or something like that. Mm-hmm. Any chance that happens? I mean, Aaron Rodgers did lead an eight and nine team last year in Green Bay. Yeah, I mean, look, anytime. Anytime a guy deep into his career changes teams, there's a chance that it all goes south and doesn't go the way you expect it to. That being said, this has the potential, I think, to be the smoothest transition. I mean, he is changing teams, but he's going to an offensive system that he's, A, familiar with. I mean, Nathaniel Hackett was his coach previously, but also, I imagine, one who will defer to him. So it's like... You know, it'll be Aaron Rodgers' offense, not anything else, at which point it should be a fairly seamless transition. The talent level there is more than good enough, I think, to function and to succeed. So, yeah, I mean, it could go bad because it's always an unknown, but I don't think it will or should. One interesting dynamic, though. Remember Rodgers? Rodgers kind of revolted a little bit against Mike McCarthy. Mm Mm-hmm. When Mike, on Mike McCarthy's way out, Matt LaFleur comes in. 2019 was LaFleur's Lef- first season. It wasn't great. Rodgers wasn't great, but they won a lot of games. And then it was 2020 and 21 where Rodgers put up unbelievable numbers, wins the MVP and all that stuff. It felt like the red zone, like so many free touchdowns in the red zone. LaFleur, LaFleur gets a lot of that credit for kind of bringing Aaron Rodgers back, saying, hey, throw over the middle of the field and, and this and that. Um I wonder how much LaFleur was the factor there. And now Rodgers is out on his own with Nathaniel Hackett and kind of doing his own thing. Is that, gonna, is that actually going to work? Well, my question would be more um, Rodgers. I mean, this is all piecing together outside information rather than having any interior insight, which is always risky. But it looks like Rodgers is one of these guys that doesn't love being 
coached hard, I guess, is the, the way, right? Doesn't like not getting his own way. Eventually acquiesces to it and does it and things go great, but doesn't like it. Like he's got, he seems to have like that natural bristling against authority and just doesn't like taking orders from people. This is a situation where I don't imagine that's going to happen. Like they've sort of set it up whereby Rogers is just going to run this thing the way Rogers wants to run it. I don't know what that results in. Like, is Rogers actually good at this, at what he wants? If Rogers gets 100, so Peyton Manning, this kind of happened with Denver, right? Denver tried to put Peyton Manning into a slightly different offense. It didn't go well. And eventually they just said, hey, Peyton, what are we running? And Peyton just ran the old version of the Colts offense, plus some modifications to the fact that he could no longer throw a seam against cover three because his neck was wrecked and his arm was a noodle. Um, Peyton Manning was evidently capable of doing that because he's one of the most cerebral quarterbacks that's ever played the game, and it went well, right? What happens if Rodgers gets given that responsibility where you say, all right, hands off, it's on you. You tell me what we're running. You tell us what we're doing. It's all you. Knock yourself out, A-Rod. Does that go well? Does, does that replicate what Peyton Manning was able to do? Or do we suddenly see, like, you actually need a coach helping you, you know, hey, this is what you should be doing in this situation. Like, Whatever you want to do is not necessarily the right thing to be doing in any given situation. I don't know. But you had Russell Wilson go to his new environment right. with Nathaniel Hackett. Now, of course, Hackett and Rodgers have a history. I'm just saying that's that might, be, that'll be an interesting story. That like might that. be the biggest risk to this situation is Rodgers gets given too much control, and it turns out that Rodgers is not the best offensive coordinator in the world in addition to being the quarterback during you know at the same time. And actually what you want is somebody who is prepared to stand up to Rodgers and say, do this, it will get the best out of you. Like, I am working with you, doesn't mean you're going to like it the whole time. All right, man, that was fun. Talking playoff teams. Yeah? What else do we have here today? So, we got an email in from Colm O'Regan, who essentially asks, uh, why are future draft picks discounted so heavily uh, when you talk trades and all those kinds of things? You hear that rule of thumb all the time that, you know, next year's draft, you take a round off, basically. If it's a second rounder next year, it's worth a third rounder this year. And that's the kind of general rule of thumb. And he basically, in his email, says, I don't understand. It makes no sense to me. Why is that? It also doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 know why, I, I know why teams think that a little bit. I think it's but I don't think it's right. It's a combination of two things. Um, number one is, as much as the round is known... The pick in the round is not. So it's like the if a, a first round pick could be pick number one, it could be pick number 32. We don't know right now. So there's an inherent risk element to trading for a future pick that we don't know how good or not it's going to be. And I think if you're doing that, the immediate reaction is to, well, let's discount it a bit because it could be a worse pick than the one we're expecting it to be. Um, and then the second element is you don't get to use it right away. you got to defer using the pick for a year and that teams don't like that particularly teams where there's a slim possibility that the people making the trades get fired and don't get to use them so i think you put those two things together and it's like the pick might not be as good as we expected to be and i can't do anything with it for 12 months i got to sit here waiting to be able to use you know the the interest that's accrued in this move you put those two things together and they're like that feels like a round discount now i agree with you that i think that's too much and there's therefore an inherent edge to constantly trading into the future because you end up better off but that's those two things put together i think explain the discount first off i don't know which consultant gm question you asked but if it's the one about me being a desperate gm i'll be like you know of course i'm going to trade next year so i'm going to trade all of next year's picks for this year's picks but yeah it doesn't it doesn't make sense because like the thing you said about there's an unknown variable which is which you know, which pick in the round is it, that still doesn't add up because teams are basically saying, I'll trade you, I'll give you a third now for a second next year. And teams are like, sure, yeah, of course, of course I'll give up my second next year for a third right now. That makes no sense from a team building standpoint if you're taking any kind of long-term plan there. That's where I do think like ownership needs to be involved there and just say, hey, desperate GM, I'm staying. You're, you might not be here. I'm going to be here though. I'm, not, I'm doing what's best by my team. I cannot let you just trade next year's higher round pick just because you want the player now. That's not good long-term team building strategy. Get the guy in the building. Oh, next year's second rounder is this year's. That's kind of stupid. Unless, 
unless you actually do have a good gauge on the strength of this year's draft versus next year's draft. Yeah. Which, like, predicting one year's draft is difficult enough. Predicting next year's draft, other than maybe high-end quarterbacks, right? who the heck's going to be able to do that? Again, the, here's the one other caveat to that. If you were doing... If you were doing that in the right year where you know maybe there's something happening in college football, NIL rules or whatever it might be, where you know there actually might be a weaker draft, well, maybe. But it just yeah. that's, not, that's not the heart of what's happening here. The heart no. of it is like, give me something now in exchange for something later, which is worth more. And it's like, yeah, that, it doesn't add up over time. Yeah, I think you can also – so I agree with you. Like Essentially trying to predict the strengths of a future draft is very, very difficult. Now, what you can do is get a – pretty good gauge on how strong the current draft is and if you think the current draft stinks then you would actually the chances are next year's is going to be really good or if you think the current draft is amazing again the chances are next year's is going to be worse so you can like you can game it at least in terms of like potent like percentage chances probabilities um the other element is if you're a well-run fran- franchise you should have a sort of two three year for uh foresight of where are, the, where are the holes opening up on the roster? When are they opening up? What is the free agent group going to look like in a year's time, assuming you know everybody makes it, all those kinds of things? So I think you can have a reasonable idea of what the talent level looks like when the needs open up on the roster and when those needs are going to open up, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are specific cases where you can be like, we want this guy now. We're prepared to lose a potential little bit of value in the trade to make it happen and it's only potential because you know both the picks only one pick is known in terms of where it's set so the next one could end up being five spots ahead it could end up being you know 35 um yeah. so there's reasons for it but i do think that it's too much like we discount yeah. it too heavily for it to make sense to just to do that as a rule of thumb yeah i agree i, wa- I don't know if there's a missing financial aspect to that that they're going to get paid more a year from now. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's a part of the equation or not. But yeah, I don't think so. The tone of the email was fun because the guys, it was basically like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Mm. How is a third better than a second? You also started <laughs> it off with an Irish phrase that I'm not even going to attempt to make you pronounce because it's, it's a doozy. It's great. Yeah, appreciate it. Don't do that. No. Um, all right, I think it's time for. Oh no, so one more, one more email before we get into. Uh, Palazzolo Consultant GM. Adam Gesk essentially asks us to explain the concept of slot only or outside only, both from a corner and a wide receiver standpoint. You know, why are these things, why would a guy be a slot only type of player? Why would a guy be an outside only type of player? He, he has a big sort of long email expanding on it and says, well, if, if these are the case, does that mean that I think he uses the, the examples of Joey Porter Jr. as an outside-only guy, and I forget who his slot-only guy was. But he's like, if, they, if, if these are true, then the, does that mean any time they meet outside, Porter wins. Any time they meet inside, the, the slot receiver wins. Um, and says, if that's the case, you know, why don't teams try and exploit that more with motion and effectively force these bad matchups? No, that's a good question. Um, I think to answer the first part, what's the difference? So an outside, they're going, to, they're going to be asked to do different things, right? So an outside receiver in corner, you're, you're going to be on the line of scrimmage more often. Therefore, you can be pressed or press. So an outside corner is going to be asked to press the outside receiver more often. The receiver is going to face press coverage more often. Therefore, that's part of your skill set. So that's why generally you want a bigger receiver out there because oftentimes they're better against press. Not always. You have shorter receivers who are good at that as well. Um, so it's a slightly different skill set there. It's also a different route tree. The inside receivers don't face as much press coverage, and they often have a two-way go. They're running a different route tree, right? The outside receivers are going to run more vertical routes. Overall, the slot receiver is going to run shorter routes. You're going to run um, with a two-way go, right, with more option routes. Yeah. There's a certain toughness that's needed to work over the middle of the field where you have some outside receivers who might not have to actually work the middle of the field a whole lot. So they are just different skill sets, both slot cor- uh, slot corners, receivers. They're all asked to just do different things. Yeah, I mean, the big differentiator, I think, is the, the sideline, the two-way go thing. So um, if you're playing on the outside as a corner, if you're defending the outside, you have the sideline as your friend. 
Like you have a defender effectively that, that takes away certain things. Where if you're defending the slot, the two-way go that we talk about, not only can they... So don't think about this necessarily in terms of releases, right? You can release inside, release outside. You can do that from the outside as well. But the route that you run can go hard in either direction. Like you can, once you break, you can be running a drag all the way across the middle of the field. You can be running an out to the sideline and essentially be sprinting away from the cornerback in either different direction. If you're defending the outside, given where the the, uh, sideline is, even if you are facing an outside release, you know, release towards the sideline and a route that breaks outside, there's a limit to how far that can go because the sideline is there, right? So you don't have to worry about this guy's going to break to the sideline and then run 20 yards away from me at a full sprint. I got to be able to cover that. You know that if it breaks to the sideline, all you've got to cover is depending on you know where you are, like the out route, the comeback, these kinds of things. So there's a much smaller number of things that, that you have to deal with from that perspective um, and they don't stress you in the same way. So that dynamic of the sideline being able to act as your, def- as your defender, which is what enables you to go and press cover essentially, right? Because he's on the line of scrimmage and you have the sideline taking away some stuff, you can get in the guy's face and essentially channel him to certain things, knowing that the chances are he's got to go in a specific way. And the only way he goes to the outside or against that leverage is probably running the sideline and then the comeback or anything like that off the back of it. So that's the big dynamic between the two. So from a wide receiver perspective, the thing that kind of separates slot only versus outside only is usually whether you think that slot receiver can play against press coverage. Because if he can't, now you can't have him on the line of scrimmage because all you're going to face is press coverage at that point. Um, So you get, generally I would look at it and say, any wide receiver can play in the slot, more or less. Not any slot receiver can play outside because they're going to have to face press coverage if they're playing as that X receiver on the line of scrimmage. If they can't play against press coverage, if they don't have the footwork, the releases, the hands for that, now you've got to either line them up in the slot or you can only line them up as the flanker, the guy that's off the line of scrimmage when he's playing outside so he doesn't get press covered. So it's a good general rule. I would say the couple outliers there is if I don't think anybody could play in the slot if an offense is running like the Wes Welker route tree. You're not going to take any right. receiver and run all the underneath stuff and the screen stuff. You actually have to have a skill set I mean, that they fits can, that. Yeah. And, and, and alternatively... The Rams are a team because they use so many tight splits. They're essentially, their outside receivers basically get the benefits of playing in the slot. So you have tight splits where you have two-way goes and stuff like that. So they're more interchangeable. So not every offense, it's a general rule, but not every, like some offenses can help break those rules because of alignment and what they ask. And from from a cornerback perspective, usually the determination is size and the ability to cover those two-way goes. So you have a lot of outside corners that do not have the foot speed, the quickness, the change of direction ability, the mirroring skills to be able to cover a two-way go. Like they can cover, so you hear a lot of the time that they can mirror receivers, but if it's playing outside, it's being able to mirror them knowing that there is a limit to what they're gonna have to cover. It sort of changes that slightly. It's very different to having to mirror, number one, from more of an off alignment because the slot is further off the line of scrimmage. There's a bigger gap between you and the receiver and knowing that one break in either direction that guy can be running at a dead sprint directly away from you and you have to try and cover that so it's that foot speed the quickness the ability to mirror either way and then on the outside it's do you have the size a to be able to press cover and b to be able to cover those vertical the vertical route tree like if you have a you know quentin johnston right if you have quentin johnston lining up outside and you say all right who's my slot guy goes outside, now he's 5'8", 180 pounds. If Quentin Johnson runs vertically, can you cover that at your size? At 5'8", 180, can you run with the guy that's 6'3", 215, and try and make any kind of play at the catch point? That's usually the limiting factor from an outside corner point of view. So the second part was, why wouldn't teams exploit this? Does that mean you you put a slot receiver on Joey Porter Jr., he's going to win every single time? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, no. doesn't mean every single time. But that you do try to create those mismatches. A couple examples that come to mind, I thought when New England played Seattle in the Super Bowl, New England's receivers, the Julian Edelmans of the world, are basically slot receivers, right? Slot receiver skill set. 
even when he lines up outside. And when he was lined up on, who was it, uh, Therald Simon? Therald Simon? Wow. Right? That's, that, that's who he beat for the game winner. When he's facing these big, long corners, or even Sherman. Like, Sherman didn't get attacked a ton there, but he's playing a lot of zone, and you just, you know, they got open underneath him. Um, so that, that's an example of, okay, the, yeah, that's, it's, those are mismatches that you would want to exploit, right? We have shiftier slot type of receivers. You have big, long corners. If they are matched up one-on-one, we can run a route tree to exploit that. The opposite, I would say, would be the rams Bengal Super Bowl. Before OBJ got hurt, I thought the Rams were very specifically putting OBJ in the slot for the vertical game against Mike Hilton. And because they ran a, after OBJ, because OBJ catches a touchdown, and he looked like he was on his way to like eight to 10 catches for a buck 50 because they were going to attack Mike Hilton, who is better on the short and underneath stuff. And they put OBJ in the slot who could win vertically. They tried it with Van Jefferson later. It just wasn't working, right? Um, that feels like the opposite where you took this outside receiver, put him in the slot and said, he's going to beat the slot corner with a different route tree than he's used to facing. So just a couple tangible examples where, yeah, teams do try to exploit that. Nothing is 100%, though. It doesn't mean you're going to win every single time. No, but I do think his point is sound that, you know, j- yes, it would result in one of those players, the, uh, the one side of that matchup winning more in the slot and then losing more when they're put outside. Like, that's how, because of the different skill sets, if you take this hyper-focused outside-only corner and hyper-focused slot-only receiver, the receiver's going to win more in the slot, the corner's going to win more when they're outside like that I think is a fair dynamic obviously it wouldn't be a hundred percent in either direction but that's that is how it would work as for why teams don't automatically just force that matchup every time with motion etc I mean one of the big things is the sheer volume of zone coverage now you don't track these guys anymore like it might have worked a lot more in an era where everybody was playing man coverage and tracking receivers and following them wherever they went but most teams are not doing that anymore. So even most teams that track receivers don't follow them into the slot for precisely that reason. Like once the guy moves into the slot, you're covering him with the, the shell of the coverage, not with the specific receiver or the specific DB that's been assigned to him when he's lined up outside. So I think, I mean, that's, you know, part of the reason that you had that classic cliche of, well, you put a guy in motion pre-snap and you can tell whether it's man or zone, you know? Because if he follows him, it's man. If he doesn't, it's zone. And that still works depending on the level of football you're in. But in the NFL, like, teams disguise this stuff. They understand how big a tell that is, and they're not necessarily going to accommodate you by just tipping off pre-snap exactly what the coverage is they're running. So you can try and exploit it, and you brought up the, the ways how, but it's not as simple as, well, we can just – Take a guy, line him up outside, and then drag him into the slot as if you're a, you know, a, a sea leviathan bringing him to the depths. Like he's just gonna sure. let, he's just gonna let you go, and cover, somebody else covers you. Joey Porter Jr. not a sea leviathan. No, the Kraken, dragging right. him to the depths. Didn't know you're a hockey guy. Yeah, Seattle Kraken. All right, is it time? It is time. No more emails. I don't believe so. All right. Well, actually, so this, this goes hand in hand, but Don Crehan uh, brought up the brilliant point that I am not in this fictitious scenario of Palazzolo consultant GM. I am not your, I am not an assistant to the GM. Neither am I the assistant GM. I am your billionaire owner. Uh-oh. With a man in tune with the mindset of a billionaire. You are. This is where I fit in this pyramid. I am the billionaire owner of the team that brings in Palazzolo Consultant GM. That's perfect. That's exactly how they should work from now on. And that fits very nicely with the, uh, the question that we're going to have today, which I need to locate now. All right. While you're locating it, I'm going to go locate the podium. Do that. Do that. We got our graphic. This is where you would cover yes. me up with the graphic. There we go. I'm off. Well, I could, but I've got to find the email. It's very difficult to talk and scroll through your mailbox at the same time, I'm discovering. Podium. Now, full disclosure, we've, uh, we've had slight training in uh, on-camera work. Very, very little training. Here. Slight training. And um, normally, people were questioning my body language last time around. I, I went hands behind my back purposely so that I didn't break the podium. The podium, here. yes, yes. But you yes. really want, you want a powerful stance and hand spread and everything, which is un- 
you know, just we're incapable of the that other thing, the other with thing the current that, podium set up here. The other thing that doesn't come across from the current camera setups is people don't appreciate that that podium is set like five feet in the air. So when, yeah, I, when I step behind that podium, I look like Bryce Young. You, you look know? like the Bryce Young Photoshop. Right, where yeah. you're like buried behind this thing that's up here. When you step behind it, it literally doesn't show up on the screen right now. All you see is the microphone coming up from the podium. But that's, that's set at a very high level. Yeah, it is. You and uh, Victor Wembenyama, whatever the guy's name is. Yeah. Just over there, you had seven-foot freak shows. All right. You ready? I'm ready for the media. So this email came in from uh, Andres Rojas, I guess. Uh, okay. This question is intended to be featured on the newly birthed segment, Consultant GM, as part of the PFF NFL podcast. My question is fairly simple. How would Steve handle being on the hot seat as an NFL GM? He's come up with this mock-up scenario. Um, whether the heat is coming externally from the media, the, the guys you're justifying yourself to right now, or internally from ownership, i.e. me, um, Steve has a gut feeling that this is potentially his last year as an NFL GM after two subpar seasons as the new GM of our random fictitious team. Uh, he's implemented his draft model with mixed results despite drafting in the top 10 consecutive years, back-to-back -back seasons with missed playoffs and a need at quarterback. Now, he's given us an optional roster and team. Give which, an entire roster. Yeah. Right, which I feel is too harsh for this scenario. <laughs> like, the, with the team that he's given you, I feel like the answer is you're just boned. So I'm going to do you slightly better than that and say, I, I'll, I'll stick with the quarterbacks. Your two quarterbacks on the roster right now are Kirk Cousins and Baker Mayfield. Okay. So that's where you're working, for, working from at the single most important position in the game. The rest of it, let's just call it a middling roster that hasn't worked out so far. Um, he's most curious how Steve would generally handle the hot seat as a GM. Certain plans and strategies can take time to come to fruition. However, we all know the current state of the NFL does not provide most with a long leash. How would you, Steve Palazzolo, consultant GM, handle the current backlash if results have not been going well? So I'm in year three here. Yeah. I'm in year three. All right, let's start off with this. This is a very fictitious scenario. There's no way the draft model would you have You can't reject the premise of the scenario. The, the, the facts are the facts. You've I would had not two find years. myself in such a ridiculous scenario. But if I did, here's where we would start. First off, this year, we're going to start trading next year's draft picks because they're discounted, <laughs> right? Because I'm discounting them because I might not be here next year. So we're going to load up on draft picks this year. We're going to draft like 14 times here in the 2023 NFL draft. we got to get... We got to get the talent in there. If the model failed for two straight years, it's absolutely going to hit this year in 2023, billionaire owner. You got to stick with me. I've got a seven year model of success in the draft. You're going to judge me off of two years? Absolutely not. You got to stick with it. You, you, you don't just move on, you don't just lose your investment. All right, we got to stick with this. We have to band together. Kirk Cousins is good enough to win with. He has to be because there's no other way to get a quarterback in today's NFL. <laughs> Kirk Cousins is my guy, and I'm going to tell you, Kirk Cousins has to be our guy. Now, we're going to keep swinging. We're going to, be keep, we're going to keep swinging for the future, but Kirk Cousins is our guy for 2023. I also might, um, I might be swinging at the receiver position, right? If we're going to take a chance here, uh, if we have to win right now, I will be calling the 49ers about Brandon Ayuk. I will be calling the Bengals about T. Higgins, and we might need to sacrifice – some future draft capital for the receiver right now. Not because I'm on the hot seat, but because we want to win. You're impatient, Sam. You're impatient. You got all your money and all that stuff. We can win right now while also trusting that the model's going to work this year and beyond. That's our starting point. Okay. So we have to get better on offense. That's our easiest chance. I mean, the good news for you is as a billionaire owner, I, I want to win. I want the Super Bowl, and I'm willing to invest to do it. You know, I'm willing to throw... Write whatever checks you want written yeah. to make this happen. You know, I just need results is what I need. Yeah, you got to stick with me, all right? It does take time. And, you know, you give me that time. But we're going we're gonna to probably move on from Kirk at the end of the season. So, you know, we'll be, we'll be good enough right now. And we're going to keep swinging at that position. And we're going to find our guy. you got to trust me, though. Hmm. Track record of success. And you, in you Excel. it's interesting as uh, as consultant GM that you've just publicly stated right now that Kirk's on the way out. 
Oh, is this a press conference? Oh, yeah. You just publicly in oh, front so of a microphone. I, I pivoted. Undermined your starting quarterback. I pivoted to a behind closed doors <laughs> discussion because you're the billionaire owner. No, I All thought right, you so were. So we need to specify. Maybe I'll come back to the table for that discussion. No, let me. I thought you were going to lean in it. to the no feels thing of, no, look, this is going to motivate him. And if it doesn't, who cares? He's on the way out anyway. <laughs> could do that. Kirk's our guy. He's got one year left on his contract. We'll see what happens at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to get paid. If he wants to get paid, he's got to produce. How about that? There you go. See? How's lean that? into your, lean into your, uh, yeah. your beliefs. This is last year. Don't back away good. from him. You better be good. Um, anything else we need to resolve here with this roster? I mean, if, if we're in this tough spot, it's just, it, it is where we are. So we're going we're gonna to trade down. We're going to bring in 12 to 14 draft picks. We're going to pretend this is you know, pre-draft, pre-draft Yeah, here. that's fair. That's fair. It's pre-draft. 12 to 14 draft picks. We're going to get five contributors for this year. That's it. All right. doing it. Well done. Any questions from the chat? <laughs> any questions from the chat? I'll I take any looked... questions from uh, the media now. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't been scanning the chat for their comments right. on your... No Joey two times or nothing, huh? Uh, and, or, ooh, Achy Dragon, I believe that's what that is, is asks, is Case Keenum available? Uh, no. Okay. No. All Don't right. need him. I have Baker Mayfield as uh-huh. my backup. That's true. Very true. I would, uh, I would also find a way to motivate Baker Mayfield to get, you know, Baker's probably competing for the starting job. Your heckler, your heckler uh, believes that I'm, I would be too cheap as an owner to fire a GM under contract. Good. I think That's you'll find, why I started working for you. I think you'll find as a billionaire owner, I would be all too happy to just blowtorch money if it meant win, get, winning a ring. That's what I want. I want the ring. And, and I'll be honest here. I got two more years on my contract. If you were like, hey, Things aren't going well. Go home. We're replacing you. <laughs> I mean, how bad is that? That'd Spend be a- more time with the family. Collect that paycheck. Could be worse. I mean, that would be that. How would hard be, could it be? That would be the fascinating behind the scenes meeting to take place. You know, we we sit down as the billionaire owner. I start strong arming you or threatening you. Look, this is it. Get it together right now, or we're gonna have to go in a different direction. And you're just like, all right. Yeah. I'm getting paid whatever. My contract's guaranteed. Do what you need to do. You're going to pay me millions. I could, you know, coach my kids in baseball, you know, watch them grow up, not spend 90 hours a week in the office, working 150 hours a week and all that. You're going to pay me to do that, to not work? Sold. Yeah. No, that's pretty good. That's actually how I handle the hot seat. Yeah. I think, I think, that's, uh, I think that's it. I think that's a Thank good job. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. I think that's, <laughs> that's a good job from uh, Steve Paolo. Steve Palazzolo, consultant GM, uh, NFL podcast at pff.com. If you want to fire off any more questions and or new fictitious scenarios for consultant GM to tackle, as we say, we've had a lot of them and uh, I like them. I think that's a good uh, weekly segment. We can't tank for uh, Caleb, Caleb Williams. We're too good. Kirk is untankable. Kirk is untankable. Yeah. Tank proof. Tank with Kirk. Who was it He's we thought was tank proof the other week, uh, the other year and then wasn't? Oh, who did we call tank proof? Somebody was tank. Oh, was it Minshew? Minshew was tank proof until he wasn't. Yeah, I thought I thought Minshew was going to keep the Jags from getting Trevor Lawrence from, tra- yeah. from, from tanking. Turns out it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean that you know that is an alternative play. I could have bench Kirk, right? Trade him. Mm-hmm. I could trade, trade him, him away. To right. I could trade him to a desperate team and say we're starting over. Let me go back. Let me go back. You can't have it. No. So you- now we're behind closed doors and say hey, that's the other option here. Right, Mister <laughs> Mister Monson. We trade away Kirk Cousins. We. Keep Baker Mayfield as the backup, and we install who like so whoever just won XF Ben DiNucci. Ben DiNucci comes in; he's our starting quarterback. The man just had a great run in the XFL MVP. He's riding high right now, right? We can sell it to the media. Those idiots in the seats, you're know, asking the dumb questions. We can we can sell it to those guys. XFL MVP. He's a he's a new lease of life. Jerry Jones believed in him. We saw some plays in the NFL. He can get it done. And then, you know, but, but behind this, you know, between you and me. I'm supposed to sell you on this. I know. I'm just So let's, I'm let's pivot it to this discussion. Now we're behind closed doors. And then the same situation, we're going to trade Kirk. And then people are going to think I'm desperate GM. I'm going to be, you know, going all in this year. We're going to take our first and second rounders. We're going to flip those to next year at the discount, right? We're going to try to get three first rounders for next year to be in position for Caleb Williams. Mm. Three first rounders for next year. I'm going to take my third rounders and lower. We're going to keep trading down. So we're still going to bring in 10 to 12 draft picks. They're all going to be round three or later, though. So we're still going to bring in talent because the model's going to hit. We're going to find four players out of 10, day three, or uh, round three and beyond, 
Next year, though, we're ready for the complete reset. Are we So, hang on. In this scenario, are we still... This is a role play scenario here. This is our behind closed doors Yeah, you're meeting. the billionaire. I'm the, gotcha. I'm the GM. So, you've just made me this pitch? Yes. Do you think I'm an idiot? Do you think I made these billions of dollars by buying that kind of overt, naked bullshit? No, Mr. Monson. I, you are on the hot seat right now because of two years of failing to live up to my expectations. And your plan to address this is yeah. to buy yourself at least another two years with one crappy season of performance just to get the guy that's supposed to get you the next contract. That's correct. I'm not buying it. I want results now. I'm going to need I've you. Given, I've paid too much money. Too sir. many of my millions have gone on this experiment already. This model was supposed to revolutionize the game. Sir. I want wins. You're going to have to hashtag trust the process. Okay. You're going you're gonna to fire me. For who? You're going to bring in Mike Mayock? Who are you going to bring in? They're going to pitch you the same thing. doesn't matter who's in my seat. They're going to pitch you the same exact thing. Blow it up. Start over, Mr. Monson. I don't think you understand. doesn't matter who's sitting in this seat. I don't think you understand the way the world works if you're a billionaire. I want results. I want them now. And if you're not giving me the results, we're going to go find somebody else that will. Yeah, go look at your other businesses. I'm sure they're go doing great right now. You're going to have to have some patience in the NFL. Because your other billionaire friends, guess what? They have patience. And they win when they have patience, okay? Do you think Bill Belichick was getting fired after year one when he won five games? No, <laughs> absolutely not. So you stick with me, I'll make you a star. What about uh, Jeffrey Lurie over there? Fired his, his Super Bowl winning head coach and then goes right back there in a couple of years. It took time, though. I'm sure it was uncomfortable. Take that much time. Way. This is fun. All right. Trust the process. Yeah. That's, uh, I don't know if that's the, the best. I, I wasn't that convinced, you know? Yeah, I could do better. We'll yeah. work on it. I, I feel like you could have done a better job of selling. You know, the models struck out for a couple of years, right? Therefore, we're due. Right. Yeah. But, you know, you got to get a hit. You know, the, the pathway to my heart as a billionaire. I need an analogy, right? That's a poker game, uh, right? Shoot, yeah. Sometimes you're going to draw out a couple of times or you're going to get a bad beat two times in a row. It doesn't mean you stop hammering when you've got the nuts. You keep going. I need that. I need, I need picture. I need color. I'll work on it. Good. We'll work. <laughs> this is, you know, when the way that the Rams hired Zach this is Robinson. Good practice for me. That's what I'm saying. You know, the way the, the Rams hired Zach Robinson. Now, this may be cutting a few corners in the story, but ostensibly because they saw him on our YouTube channel making a lot of sense about their offense, right? They're like, that, that's a smart man. They'll hire him. Um, this, is, this is your audition right now. Yeah. There's, there's an owner out there. There's the real version of me, the billionaire owner, watching this and being like, hmm. I, I like that. Get him in the building. I like the cut of that guy's jib. Yeah. Get let's, him in the building. Let's bring right him in. Now. Well, I appreciate you helping to uh, build my resume. I hmm. uh, got some work to do in front of the media. got some work to do you know, with the billionaires, but uh, we'll get there. Hmm. We're going to keep working. How hard could it be? Right. The, 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 the flaw of this plan is, I mean, it works perfectly from your side of things in that, theoretically, a billionaire crawling the PFF YouTube channel could look at this and go, yeah, that could, that's a, that's a, I buy that. That's smart. I'm going to hire that guy right now. It's more difficult to envisage a scenario where somebody watching this would give me billions of dollars. Yeah, that's, that's also true. Right. I'll also say it is, I imagine it's really difficult to be a GM of just one team. You know what I mean? Like, but, like what we do, we sit here, we analyze all 32 teams, and it's just easy to do. When you truly are saddled with what, what you have. Specifics is your problem. This, well, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just... Just speaking candidly with you, yeah. not the billionaire owner. No, I get when that. When you have the quarterback that you have, and it's like, all right, go figure out how to win with him. But that's why – Try to like, go win with Derek Carr, <laughs> right? Like some teams are like, I can't win with Derek Carr. And then other teams are like, give me Derek Carr because I've got nothing else. When you have the mid-tier quarterback and everything else, it is – it's a challenge to figure out where that next thing is. Well, that's why I think – that's why I think you have to talk through all of these various like concepts and rules of thumb and all this sort of stuff in with a bit of nuance. You can't just like because as soon as you introduce specifics to the equation, it does get a lot harder. Like, sure, it's easy to stick to your principles if nothing's at stake and it's all abstract uh, abstractions and it's all theoretical. But as soon as you're like, all right, here's the exact scenario you're dealing with. Here's the talent you have right now. Like you, you're presented with an actual case study of what you should do, well, now the lines get blurrier, which is why I think for Detroit, you know, I th we, you, when it happens live, your initial reaction to basically their first four picks is, 
what are they doing? Like, they're just taking off the least consequential positions on the roster. This is madness. And then when you start with a bit of, uh, you know, hindsight and, and time to let you process it, you can kind of see from a specific standpoint why they actually went in, this, in the same direction, you know, multiple times. And you end up, I, I at least come back to this idea of, you know what, I'm fine with that draft outside of the Jameer Gibbs pick, which is the one that I would still push back on and say, I still think the opportunity cost left on the table there was too much. But I don't really have a problem with the Jack Campbell pick, even at 18. I don't really have a problem with the two second round picks, even though, oh, we left Michael Mayer out there and, oh, we, you know, and we drafted a safety. I, I'm, I'm actually okay with that draft outside of the, the Jameer Gibbs thing. So it's a, it's a point worth making that this is really easy in total abstractions where there's nothing causing problems in any way, shape, or form. But as soon as you do introduce the exact scenario that each NFL team is dealing with, it does make it more complicated. And that's why I think people need to tap the brakes a little before they just declare every GM or coach an idiot. Because most of them aren't. Now, there are, you know, <laughs> but most of them... It's easy in this seat. Right. It's not easy up at that podium seat. But, like, generally speaking, the default position to a curious move probably shouldn't be, that guy's an idiot. It's like, well, he probably isn't an idiot. And, in fact, there are, like, four different things that are at least pushing, pressuring the rules of thumb to make them go in a different direction. I just want to wrap it up with this. That So... Because every team is in a different part of their life cycle and all that stuff, that goes all the way back to that question about devaluing future draft picks. If there are teams who can be patient, and you know you're going to be here in the future, and you know you've got a five- and a ten-year plan, and you are trying to make the long-term best decisions for your, for your team, you could take advantage of that. You could take advantage of other teams being a little bit more desperate because you're more stable. Right. And, in, and in, it, um that that's one thing and then the other thing was i think you know people were analyzing i saw some article a headline about the eagles draft and the the executive said it was like the eagles just sat there because and they said we're so deep everywhere we just drafted all the best football players and it's like yeah that really that legitimately should be the strategy for all 32 teams i know it doesn't always work out that way you don't always go into the draft with your needs filled and you you have to quote unquote reach and fill depth chart spots and all that stuff. But every team should aspire to that. It shouldn't just be, oh, the Eagles, man, they're just so lucky. They're just so lucky they got to go draft the best players. Like if you actually had the discipline and actually did just draft the best football players, even if you have holes on your roster, you would win over time. But teams don't do that because there are these other factors that, that go into the picks. Yeah, and I think that element that the whole premise was built upon that there are pressures like individual saving job pressures and how like like how much of a how much rope you have to keep doing this it's a real thing like as soon as you're there two years haven't gone well you're and you're on the hot seat you're immediately like to hell with the discount start giving me some draft picks so we can make some impact you know what i mean like it, it does completely change your motivations if you think you have plenty of time in the job or if you think you have like a season to, to make this happen because ultimately you, it's not necessarily as simple as what well, immediately your your intentions are not as are not the same as the NFL teams. Like you're no longer doing the best for that franchise because selfishly everybody in that job is going to believe that they're the per, the best person for that job, right? You as GM are going to be like, no, I I'm still the guy to make this work, but I so but in order to prove that I need to keep I need to save my job, right? So you're going to change what your ideal approach would be, long-term, playing for the future, maximizing you know, return and all those kinds of things. You're going to flip that and you're going to go, crap, I need short-term return in order to save my job so that I can still do the long-term stuff. So it's not necessarily as simple as, well, he's no longer acting in the best interests of the team because in his brain, he still is, right? He still yeah. thinks that he's the best guy to make this happen, but I need to do it in a different way. Otherwise, I'm going to get fired and never get the chance to do that. That's where the owner's got to keep him in check. Got to keep him in check. But, I mean, he might not be wrong. You know what I mean? Like, that's the thing. It's not as simple as, well, he's, he's acting against the team's best interest now, so the owner needs to step in and fire his ass, right? Because he might be right. Like, you know, the, Bill Belichick got fired from the Browns because things had gone south a little bit. They got rid of him. He goes to New England. Like, he might have been the best person for the Browns. The Browns could have been the dynasty 
of the 2000s if the owner hadn't been too, you know, or if they hadn't been too quick to boot Bill Belichick. You know what I mean? Yeah. It might be true that that guy is the right person for the job, but has to pr- avoid getting fired in order to prove that. Well, it was fun. We can keep doing it. Fire those questions over. Uh, throw what? Consultant GM. Yes. In the title. Correct. And it'll be easier to find those. So we'll. appreciate those questions. Appreciate everybody being a part of the show. All right. We'll be back again tomorrow. Uh, send more emails. What are we talking about tomorrow? Don't even know yet. Yeah. Um, oh, and then Monday. So Monday we're going to set up the expansion draft officially. And then it might be a two-part show because we have the expansion draft and the actual NFL draft. Each of our teams will have 12 picks apiece. So we get to redo the NFL draft and we'll have the expansion draft and we'll uh, compare teams. Mm-hmm. Both, you know, in the moment and, uh, and going forward. We'll test it out with our friends probably over at uh, All-22. So a lot of fun coming up here. PFF NFL Podcast. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you again tomorrow.